Salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland. This video is about how to chair a debate. Um, so the chairman or the chairwoman sits at the head of the chamber and he or she will have the proposition on the right hand side and the opposition on the left hand side. Uh, so that's the way it is as a convention. Everybody knows they come into debate halfway through. They can tell which side is speaking from are they to the right or to the left of the chairman and is the first proposition will be nearest the uh, chairman. The second proposition speaker will be one further away. The third proposition speaker will be another further away and so forth. Remember the first opposition speaker will be nearest the chairman on his left. The second opposition speaker will be one further away on the left hand side of the chairman. And the third opposition speaker will be further away than that on the left hand side of the speaker and so forth. Oh sorry, on the left hand side of the chairman or chairwoman. Now we sometimes use the gender neutral term the chair, not meaning a piece of furniture but meaning the person. And we're using chair as a verb to chair the debate. Some debating societies elect a president, um, so you might say the president rather than the chair. And remember, you're speaking to the chair, you address him or her as Mr. Chair or Madam Chair, um, or the president as Mr. President, Madam President, not Miss President, not Miss Chair, things like that, uh, and not the person's name either. All right? So remember, the uh, chair has to be neutral cannot express any opinion uh, favorable to either side, uh, either verbally or shouldn't do so facially, like <clears throat> wincing at an argument you find unconvincing or distasteful, or smiling or nodding your head vigorously to uh, indicate support or sympathy, right? You must have a poker face. Um, so you express no view in this. You can speak in other debates, but not in this particular debate. You must be even-handed, unbiased, do it in a neutral fashion. All right, so um, the chair is the voice of authority. He or she doesn't say very much, stands to speak. This person will be dressed up in their finest clothes in a suit. The Oxford Union Society is one of the most ancient and estimable debating societies in the world. That's where I cut my teeth. And the uh, chairman or the president would wear white tie, a black tail suit with knee breeches and a low slung white silken waistcoat, a white dress shirt with a uh, um, white bow tie. Ladies would wear the equivalent, which would be um, a ball gown. All right, so the most formal possible dress. I'm not very formally dressed today. Uh, and comport yourself with decorum, uh, because the dignity of the society is reflected back to it through you and all the rest of it. So then I'll say the bits they need to say, and I'll try and say them in the right manner, carried off with some panache. So remember, you've got to speak with Elan, engage people. Um, you don't have to say very much, but it must be said very effectively and authoritatively. So first of all, stand up when you're going to begin the debate, and then you'd uh, call the chamber to order. So everyone's going to be quiet, everyone else is going to be sitting down, ready for the debate to begin. So listen to this. Order, order. I call this house to order. The motion before the house is... Uh, this house believes that smoking should be against the law. I now call upon Joe Bloggs to propose the motion which stands in his name. You might start applauding as you do so, sitting down, because we're giving Joe Bloggs a good start. Joe Bloggs being a generic name, just any man, so I've made it up. So you've got to have your voice carrying, make people listen to you, begin decisively. You don't want a false, false start. Some people who are rather poor at chairing would say it uncertainly, too quietly, not making eye contact, not with, a, with not booming it out, and therefore have to do it again and again, and the effect is lost. So you don't say very much, but it's got to be said at volume, uh, and it must also be clearly enunciated. So you sit down, Joe Bloggs stands up, first proposition speaker, he says his piece. Now, there may be a time limit announced already. You might be timing it yourself if you're the chair. Or you might have someone else who's, who's timing it for you, a timekeeper or a secretary or something. So we don't rigidly stick to time limits. Supposing it was five minutes. If they did five minutes, ten seconds, we'd say nothing. If they went significantly over, like five minutes, twenty seconds, it would be indicated to the speaker, like nodding at them, making facial expressions, tapping on the desk, signals, wind up, wind up, bring it to a close. If they're more like five minutes, thirty seconds, we might say, you know, cut it off, stop right now. Might be handing them a card saying, sit down, things like that. 
If it was really bad, then the chairman would just have to stand up and, and cut them off and say, your time is up, you will sit down now, please, and obviously count against them, especially if it's a competitive debate. Many debates, there are hundreds of people in the audience who vote whether they agree the motion or not. But there might be judges who are judging who's the best speaker. And if somebody goes significantly over, it's really bad. All right, so first proposition is finished. I'm going to stand up. I thank the Honourable Member for his speech, and I now call upon Joanna Bloggs to open the case for the opposition. And I would applaud as I'm sitting down. So we thank everybody. We're calling them Honourable Members. If we call them Honourable, uh, we vainly hope they will behave honourably. Uh, and it goes on like that. So she says her piece for five minutes or thereabouts. And so long as she doesn't go uh, seriously over, we'd say nothing about that. She doesn't have to fill five minutes. Four minutes of, of genius is better than five minutes of guff. All right. So I've seen people ruin it by going on too long, having um, a few minutes of excellent content and some minutes which are weak or even repeating themselves. And it can be worse. So it, it can be a case of quality more than quantity. Anyway, she sat down and insists they must stand to speak. They must be seen, they must project their voice. So I'll rise to my feet again and say, I thank the Honourable Member for her speech, and I now call upon Chubbington Snodgrass to, to continue the case for the proposition. I'll sit down again. So he must rise, and he will speak from a standing position. Obviously, if someone's in a wheelchair or crutches, we can, we can make exceptions in those cases. And he will say his piece. I'll listen quietly. The only time you'd intervene if, say, they, they use a swear word or something, that might be unacceptable in your society, you must stand and ask them to withdraw their remark. If they refuse to do so, you could terminate their speech immediately. You could even eject them from the chamber. There might be something you thought was utterly uncivilised. Now, the, the, the boundaries are wide because we can't be shutting people down too easily. This is all about freedom of expression and expressing opinions, including highly controversial opinions. But if you think it's really beyond the pale, then you might be obliged to step in. I've never had to do it. Um, so be cautious uh, about using that power of yours. Um, all right, then he's finished, so I shall stand up and I shall say my piece. I thank uh, the Honourable uh, Member for his speech. And I now call upon Arethusa Franklin to continue the case for the opposition. I shall stand down, stand down, sit down rather, once more. And so it continues. All right, um, and then I will carry on. She's finished her piece. I thank the Honourable Member for her speech. Uh, and I now call upon Demosthenes of Greece to continue the case for the proposition. And I applaud, of course, as I'm sitting down. He rises to his feet and then he holds forth. Uh, that being done, he's sat down to indicate he has done. And I will stand up once again. I thank the Honourable Member for his speech. And I now call upon um, Ariana Huffington to close the case for the opposition and indeed the whole debate. And I will sit down and she will say her piece. Now, the words I've used are not precise. You don't have to use exactly this form of words. Something roughly like that. The important message are that you're asking such and such a person to speak. You're saying whether than the proposition of the opposition, you might point out that so-and-so is the first speaker opening the case for his side of the house or her side of the house, pointing out that so-and-so is, is ending the case for this side of the house. So the proposition is one side of the house, the opposition is the other side of the house. I've heard people get confused saying our house, the opposition. No, 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 no. Everybody in the room is the house. The house is the debating society or the debating club. The proposition, the opposition, and those members of the audience watching, we're all the House, including the President. That's why this House believes whatever. Motions are usually framed in that way. This House believes that cars should be abolished. This House believes that the future is bright. Something like that. So we call this these statements a motion. Some debating societies call them a resolution. Same thing. The United Nations calls it a resolution. Same thing. Same as a motion. These words are synonyms. Um, and then that being done, I might say, uh, I now move to the vote. All those in favour of the motion raise their hand. Now you might have tellers. Tellers are in charge of counting the votes. Say, so write up, write up, put them up like this. Don't put your hand up like that or make it clear. And uh, you can also allow people to abstain. Abstentions being neutral, not voting for the motion, not voting against the motion. 
So voting for the motion, that's supporting the proposition. They were arguing for the motion. Voting against the motion, that's supporting the opposition because they were against the motion. That's the way it goes. Some people may abstain, as in not vote for either side. And you might actually count the abstentions. So to abstain is the verb, abstention is the noun. The only person in the room who is not permitted to vote is me. Uh, the chairman or the chairwoman is not allowed to vote, must remain strictly neutral. If you have a secretary, a timekeeper, these people are permitted to vote. You are not. What if there was exactly the same number of votes for the proposition and opposition? Who wins? The opposition. If it's 100 votes on this side and 100 votes on the other side of the house, the opposition wins. The proposition has to get the same number of votes as the opposition plus one in order to win because the onus is on the proposition to prove their case. They're suggesting a new idea. Or we accept something, often a change. So the default setting is the opposition win. The proposition have got the small advantage of speaking first. You remember what you hear first more than you hear last. Supposing nobody voted, supposing everybody abstained, the opposition would win. There are no draws in debating. There's always a winner and a loser. That's the way it goes. Very, very rare for that to happen because you often have dozens or even hundreds of people watching. So it'd be highly unusual for exactly the same number of votes to be cast on both sides. We don't do secret ballot in debating. Some debating chambers, it's the way you leave the chamber. There's a poll, eyes on one side, nose on the other side. You choose right or left, depending on voting aye, that's yes to the motion, or no, so that's no to the motion. Tell us, counting the number of people who go through. If you wish to abstain, tell the tellers. They'll count you as an abstention, and they won't count you as a vote. So that's the way to chair a debate. Sometimes you might vote for absolute division, which is unusual. Say you have to walk to that side of the room to vote for the proposition, or walk to that side of the room for, to vote for the opposition. Again, that's um, highly unusual. Another rare way to vote is vote by acclamation, which is shouting. Say all those in favour of the motion shout I, as in A-Y-E, meaning yes, and they shout I. All those against the motion shout no, they shout no. We don't get the abstentions to, to, to um, um, shout. And the, the chair has to judge it, gauge the volume. Was that louder for I or louder for no? They honestly used to hold elections like that in the 18th century sometimes. Um, so it's a very unscientific method of working out who, who won, who made more noise. It's, it's faintly silly. They did in the Oxford Union in, in emergency debates. So, but mainly you vote by show of hands. So that is how to chair a debate. And then you declare um, the proposition have more votes. So I declare the motion carried the proposition to win. Or the opposition have more votes. So I declare the motion defeated. The motion has fallen. So the opposition have won. You say it like that. And then you can say, and I now close this debating session.